الطيب سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين رب اشرح صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. How is everyone? Uncle, time? Join, join, join the party. Chai is coming late on it. Just for you, Uncle, you speak. And whiskey, I'm not, no problem. Hey, Chris? Anything, inshallah. Firstly, I'm going to kindly request my brothers, especially the youngsters in that room, to come forward. It's good. Akhlaq, I'm going to speak to you here, not me, but the Akhlaq we should sit forward, we should sit close <coughs> to take more benefit from their lessons. We begin by thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to arrange this program. We have approximately a week before Ramadan, so it makes sense to get ourselves mentally, spiritually prepared. And so we thank our speakers who have come today, taken time out of their day. <coughs> we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He makes it beneficial for us and that he also accepts it from us as well. As we know, Ramadan has a pinnacle point around it, and that is the fact that it is Shahul Qur'an. It is the month of the Qur'an. It is the month the Qur'an was revealed, it is the month the Qur'an is recited and reflected upon. And so it's only befitting that we start today's program with recitation of the Qur'an. So we ask Qari Hamad to come up, to recite and share some verses with us <coughs> and he will also translate so that everyone can benefit and everyone <coughs> can reflect on these verses Thank you. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودَاتٍ فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ وعلى الذين يطيقونه فدية طعام مسكين فمن تطوع خيرا فهو خير له أن تصوموا خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصمه ومن كان مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر ولتكملوا العدة ولتكبروا الله ولتكبروا الله على ما هداكم ولعلكم تشكرون وإذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الذات 
داعي إذا دعان أجيب دعوة الداعي إذا دعان فليستجيبوا لي وليؤمنوا بي لعلهم يرشدون لعلهم يرشدون وحل لكم ليلة الصيام الرفث وحل لكم ليلة الصيام الرفث إلى نسائكم هن لباس لكم وأنتم لباس لهن علم الله أنكم كنتم تختانون أنفسكم فتاب عليكم وعفى عنكم فالآن باشروهن وابتغوا ما كتب الله لكم وكلوا واشربوا حتى يتبين لكم الخيط الأبيض حتى يتبين لكم الخيط الأبيض من الخيط الأسود من الفجر ثم أتم الصيام إلى الليل ولا تباشروهن وأنتم عاكفون في المساجد تلك حدود الله فلا تقربوها كذلك يبين الله آياته للناس كذلك يبين الله لآية كذلك يبين الله آياته للناس لعلهم يتقون ولا تأكلوا أموالكم بينكم بالباطل وتدلوا بها إلى الحكام وتدلوا بها إلى الحكام لتأكلوا فريقا من أموال الناس من أموال الناس بالإثم وأنتم تعلمون يسألونك عن الأهلة قل هي مواقيت للناس والحج وليس البر بأن تأتوا البيوت من ظهورها ولكن البر من اتقى وأتوا البيوت من أبوابها واتقوا الله لعلكم تفلحون do the translation now inshallah as well um, oh you who believe fasting is prescribed for you as it was for those before you so that you become mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala observing fast for a fixed number of days but if any of you is ill or on a journey the same number should be made up from other days and as for those who can fast with difficulty they have uh, to feed a poor person for every day that they missed but whoever does a good deed on his own accord it is better for him and that you fast it is better for you if only you know if only you knew the month of ramadan in which was revealed the quran a guidance for mankind and clear proofs for the guidance of the criterion between right and wrong so whoever of you cites the crescent on the first night of the month he must observe psalm i.e. fast that month and whoever is ill or on a journey the same number of days should be made up from other days allah intends for you ease and he does not want to make things difficult for you he wants that you must complete the same number of days and that you must magnify allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on seeing the crescent of the month of ramadan and shawwal for having guided you so that you may be grateful to him and when my slaves ask you, O Muhammad, concerning me, then answer them, I am indeed near to them by my knowledge. In, I respond to the calling of the supplicant when he calls on me alone. So let them obey me and believe in me so that they may, le so that they may, so that they may, so that they may be led aright. It is made lawful for you to have relations with your wives on the night of fasting. They are clothing for you and you are clothing for them. Allah knows that you used to deceive yourselves, so he, so he turned to you, accepted your, accepted your repentance and forgave you. So now have relations with them and seek that which Allah has ordained for you, i.e. offspring, and eat and drink until the white light of dawn appears to you distinct from the black thread. And then complete your fast till the night fall and do not have relations with your wife whilst you are in the masajid these are the boundaries set by allah so do not go near them thus allah thus does allah make his ayat clear to mankind 
that they become muttaqoon, God-fearing people, and do not consume another one's wealth unjustly or send it in bribery to the rulers in order that they may aid you to consume a portion of the wealth of the people in sin, whilst you know it is unlawful. And they ask you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about the new moon, say they are measurements of time for the people and for hajj and it is not righteousness to enter houses from the back but righteousness is in who fears allah and enters and who enters houses from their doors and fear allah that you may succeed Make us all Sahib al Quran, companions of the Quran. Inshallah, we'll begin with our first talk, which is titled Making the Most of Ramadan. And I don't want to take too much of your time, but what we should do is just look around the masjid today, and perhaps there is an uncle that is no longer with us. <coughs> today, in fact, there was a, uh, the brothers were sitting in memory of somebody who had passed away. And so we should have this mindset that this may be our last Ramadan. And so what a perfect time and what a perfect opportunity for us to learn how to make the most of Ramadan. So shall I call up our first speaker, Ustad Ihsan, who's a graduate of Medina University. I'm sure you guys recognize him from our conference a few months ago. And uh, we thank him a lot. We ask Allah SWT to reward him. He is uh, close to our masjid, close to our hearts. And so I hand it over to him. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. Ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Amma ba'd. I'd like to thank the masjid for organizing this talk and inviting me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue, continue to grant them tawfiq and khair. And likewise, I'd like to thank all of you for attending as well to listen to these words. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala count it amongst your good deeds as well. Ameen. The Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he said, La yashkurullah man la yashkurun nas. He does not thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly the one who does not thank the people. The talk today that has been assigned is how to make the most of Ramadan or making the most of Ramadan. When we hear this phrase, making the most of something, then what comes to your mind? What comes to, to, to your mind when somebody says, make the most of this, make the most of this opportunity, make the most of these holidays, make the most of whatever you're doing. <laughs> making the most of something, basically what that means and what that refers to, is benefiting from it as much as you can benefiting from this opportunity benefiting from this event or benefiting from anything so making the most of something is attaining as much goodness as you can from it as for the month of ramadan and we know of its <coughs> virtues there are many virtues and of course you're going to hear the talk by ustad husnain in regards to the virtues of the month of ramadan but the month of Ramadan contains within it those virtues that cannot be sought at any other time of the year. Just like Abu Qari Hamad recited, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He describes these days as ayyamun ma'dudat, only a specific number of days. It doesn't happen every day. I mean, Ramadan is not every day. It only comes once in a year and that too 29 or 30 days the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he told us that there are two blessings that many people lose out on ni'matani maghbunun fiha or fihima kathirun minan nas these two blessings that we don't really think about or ponder over or recognize and many, many, many of the people, they lose out on these two blessings. 
The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "As-sihhatu wal faragh, good health and time. Your good health that you have, especially in your young days." The Prophet alaihi salatu wasallam. Why did he highlight health? It's because when you are at your healthiest, at your prime, you're able to do many things, activities. You don't get tired as much. You have enough energy, etc., etc. So that should be used in your advantage in worshiping Allah subhanahu wa taala. Number one. The second thing is al farag which is your time, your spare time that you have. <coughs> Many people they waste their time. Their time is is wasted on things that don't benefit them. So if you have time to spend, then spend it in the way of Allah Azza wa Jal. That's what this hadith is referring to. And until you realize the reality of these two things, only then when you realize the qima, the worth of Ramadan, and the fact that you should make the most of it. And like our brother Abdullah mentioned, that many people may not see the month of Ramadan, there's only nine days left. How many people were here last year and they're not here today? I'm sure you must know. Either you know or somebody you know who knows. And the life is not guaranteed. They were here last year but they're not here today. It was only a few days ago, one of our close friends, his father passed away. And there was 11 days left of the month of Ramadan. And perhaps he hoped to see it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained otherwise. Nobody is guaranteed to wake up in the morning. So you should realize this fact and implement it in your life. That we are not given a second chance. Whatever we have right now, our lives when we're breathing, all of it must be done now. Not later, not next year, not in five years or ten. Now should be the change. Because you may, ne you may never see another day. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us about the month of Ramadan. Now when Ramadan comes, a caller calls out in the heavens. An angel, he calls out, Ya baghi lil khayri, aqbil. O you who wants to do good, come forth and do it. Wa ya baghi lil sharr, aqsir. And O you who wants to do evil, then stop and desist. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us the chance to change ourselves, to better ourselves, to strengthen our relationship with Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. The month of Ramadan is not a month where the believer, he begins his relationship with Allah. No, rather it's the time where he strengthens his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has something that he has, yani previous, before Ramadan, that he, he strengthens, he increases in. Many people they think Ramadan is the time where we're going to pray Salah now, five times a day. We're going to be good, we're going to give Sadaqah, we're going to read Quran. You should be doing these things anyways. Ramadan is not the time for you to be doing them as a starting off. Rather you should, be, have, you should have, been, have been doing these actions way before, especially the Salah. Ramadan is only a time where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies these deeds for you. He increases the reward in this month. The month of Ramadan, of course, the main feature of it is the fast. Just like those verses are recited. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum as siyamu kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum. O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed upon you, just like it was prescribed on those who came before you. For what reason? La'allakum tattaqoon. So that you can have taqwa. The whole point of fasting is taqwa. And along with that, iman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he calls out to the people of iman. And he ends, the, uh, he ends it by saying, the reason for it, that you have taqwa. You have taqwa of Allah azza wa jal. So these two things, iman and taqwa, they go hand in hand. And the one who understands what iman is, and the one who understands what taqwa is, then this one will make the most of Ramadan. When you have Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that everything Allah Azza wa Jalla told you about the rewards of this month, that you truly and actually believe in them.
Because a lot of the times when we hear these virtues and we hear these ahadith, we just think to ourselves, MashaAllah, what a great reward. That whoever fasts, then he gets this. And whoever prays the night, he gets that. And so on and so forth. We hear these rewards constantly. But do you actually have Iman that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you these rewards? And that's where the problem it begins, is our Iman. It's not as strong, it's not where it should be. If I said to you, you know, whoever comes to the masjid for the five daily prayers for the next 29 to 30 days, and I'll give that person 100 pounds for doing so, every single one would turn up or at least try their very, very best to turn up because they know they have that belief or they have that yaqeen that they're going to receive money from, from me. So you're going to come because you want that money, you want some reward. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's reward is far greater than a mere 100 pounds. But that's only if you truly believe and have iman in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually going to give you what He promised you. And Allah Azzawajal does not break His promise. You have to decide now, do you really believe that Allah is going to reward you in such a manner? If you do, then that should drive you. That should make you make the most of your Ramadan. First and foremost, by fasting. And fasting, siyam, as is known in Arabic, it means linguistically, al-imsak, to refrain from something. And more specifically, it means to refrain from eating and drinking. And anything that breaks the fast, from the time of the Adhan of Fajr until Maghrib. That's what fasting is. That you stop yourself from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you to stop. Yani from eating and drinking and marital relations. So fasting, my brothers and sisters, is the key element to Ramadan. It's not just from food and drink and these issues, but also your sins. al imsaka and al maasi Refraining from entering into sin. And doing those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is displeased with or angry with. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَنْ لَمْ يَدَعْ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ أَوْ الْعَمَلُ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةً أَنْ يَضَعْ طَعَامَهُ شَرَابًا the one who fasts and he does not leave off evil speech and evil action, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not care if this person leaves off his food and his drink. So you should make the most of the month of Ramadan by refraining from foul speech and argumentation and evil actions and deeds. Just like the angel he called out, Ya baghi li shar aqsir. Oh you who wants to do evil, then stop, desist. If you want to really do it, okay, do it when the month of Ramadan goes. But don't violate the sanctity of this blessed month. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the doors of paradise and He closes the doors of hell only for your own betterment, yet you still refuse. You still have those habits. You still smoke, you still drink, you still indulge in drugs, you still swear, your conduct is still evil. You continue to watch those movies. You continue to listen to that music. When are you going to give these things up? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes your soul? When, that it's, when it's too late and you can't change the, 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 the hands of time? When are you going to give up these evil habits? Ramadan is the opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you. If you reach this here, the month of Ramadan. And that's what the fasting has been yani, made for us. That's the purpose of the fast. So that we can learn this taqwa, increase our iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said and He told us, as, if, as per the hadith al Qudsi, that all of the deeds that the son of Adam He does, they are for Himself. The salah, the zakat, the sadaqah, the hajj, the umrah, all of these deeds are for you and your own betterment. But as for the siyam, the fasting, then it is for me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa ana ajzi'u bihi. And I will reward my slave for it. Because when you fast, nobody sees you. Nobody sees you fasting. If I meet you on the street, I don't know if you're fasting or not, unless you tell me. So it's something between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fasting, is, the fasting of Ramadan, it teaches us many things. It teaches us di discipline, dedication, perseverance, and consistency. When you are at home and you're fasting, it is very easy for you to get up go to the kitchen, eat and drink something and no one's going to see you from the people. 
It's not hard, is it? It's very easy. But why don't you do that? If you're home all alone, if you're on your own, no one sees you from the people. Of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. Well, what's stopping you from eating and drinking? Just do it. Why won't you? Because of that iman and that taqwa in your heart that prevents you from doing so. That same iman and taqwa should remain after the month of Ramadan as well. If you can prevent yourself from eating and drinking because you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the month of Ramadan, then that's the same Lord that you worship outside the month of Ramadan as well. So fast and fast for the sake of Allah. And there are some people who don't, perhaps they fast the whole month of Ramadan. They might miss a few fasts or they might break their fasts. That's only because of the evilness of their own souls. And you can't blame the shaitan. As the Prophet ﷺ told us, the shaitan, he is locked up in the month of Ramadan. The influence is heavily, heavily reduced. And that explains why some people still commit sins in the month of Ramadan. And the shayateen are locked up. So who is the real shaitan? These are questions that you should ask yourselves, my brothers and sisters. The month of Ramadan was made for fasting, for refraining from food and drink, marital relations, refraining from sin, and focusing on ibadah. And that is the essence of taqwa. Fudail ibn Iyad rahimahullah ta'ala from the Salaf rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that taqwa is like walking upon a path. And upon the path, you have shattered pieces of glass. And a person, he is barefooted. So when you walk upon this path, what do you do? You tread carefully. He said that is taqwa, treading upon a, a path that has broken glass on it. Because if you're going to walk on a, upon a path that has broken glass, what, how are you going to walk? You're going to walk very cautiously. You're going to look at where you're stepping so you don't cut yourself. That path is a path of obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal. And those pieces of glass are the sins that the shaitan he puts in your way. Either you step on them and cut yourself and then harm yourself, or you avoid it by obeying the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't make this Ramadan a Ramadan that it passes by and you're not forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or Ramadan that passes by and you haven't done good enough. How many Ramadans have gone by and it's the same thing every single year? No one reads the Quran as much. Nobody really cares about what they do on the fast. The taraweeh, you'll miss some or you'll pray some and you'll sit at the back and you relax. There's no himma, there's no desire, there's no passion. At the start there is. Then give it a week or two, or even if, even if a few days for some, then the passion it dies out. And then you resume back to normality. Don't let this Ramadan pass without you feeling that you have done as much as you have, 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 have could have. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was on the member. And when he descended, he said three times, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why did you say Ameen, Ameen, Ameen? Why did you say it three times? We only heard you say Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. You never made dua. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told them that in that moment, the angel Jibreel alayhi salam came to me and he said, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may that person's nose be rubbed in the dust this phrase, may the, may, may the person's nose be rubbed in the dust, is an Arab saying, yani, may that person be shamed, may, may shame upon that individual. Jibreel alayhi salatu salam, he said, may that person's nose be rubbed in the dust, shame on that individual, that he does not enter paradise because of his parents. Say, Ameen. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Ameen. Then Jibreel alayhi salatu salam, he made a second dua. He said, may that person's nose be rubbed in the dust, Shame on that individual that when the month of Ramadan comes, he is not forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he enters into the hellfire. Say Ameen. So the Prophet alayhi salatu salam said Ameen. And then Jibreel alayhi salatu salam, he made the third dua. He said, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may that person's nose be rubbed in the dust. Shame upon that individual that when you are mentioned, he does not say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say Ameen. So the Prophet والسلام, he said Ameen. These are the three du'as that the Messenger of Allah والسلام, said Ameen to. 
The one who does not enter into paradise because he was not good towards his parents. He never obeyed his parents. He didn't do his duty towards his parents, so he doesn't enter paradise because of them. The last one was the ones who do not send salawat upon the name of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa when they hear his name. And the one that concerns us today is that dua that Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam made. That may that person be shamed. The one the month of Ramadan comes, he is not forgiven. He's the same in Ramadan as he was outside the month of Ramadan. A rebellious sinner. And know that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, if he makes dua, if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam makes dua, then it is accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal. So try, not, try to be, not to be from those people who the month, when the month of Ramadan comes, he's not forgiven. Refrain, beware of this dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You don't want to be in that category who is not forgiven by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So fasting, my brothers and sisters, is just more than refra refraining from eating and drinking. It's much, much more than that. It's about your actions, about your amal, about your deeds, your conduct, how you are. The Prophet ﷺ also told us that if a person is fasting and someone wants to argue with you, or he wants to fight with you, then say to him, Inni sa'imun. Say to that person, I'm a fasting person. I'm fasting. And just walk away. Because you don't have time. You don't have time to waste. You don't have these good deeds to squander. The Prophet ﷺ said, Man sama Ramadana iman and wahti saban. The one who fasts in these days with Iman and seeking reward in Allah, he has hope in the reward of Allah Azza wa Jal, then Allah forgives all of his sins. Of course, except for the major ones. The major ones you must repent from. But the minor ones, all of them are forgiven. So that's one of the most key components of the Ramadan is the fast. So make the most of your fast. After fasting, we have the reading of the Qur'an, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do you make the most of your Ramadan when it comes to reading Qur'an? Put your hands up. How many of you have finished reading the entire Qur'an this year, from January to March? Put your hands up if you finished one reading of the Qur'an at least. Anybody? MashaAllah, one, two, three, four, five, six, MashaAllah. Some young, some old, and no one in between. Either the young people have finished the Qur'an at least once, or the elderly people. What about those who are in between? Probably one or two. All of our hands should have been raised in the air to finish the Qur'an. The ulama, they say, the one who does not complete the Qur'an within 40 days, and this is based on a hadith and a narration, the one who does not complete one khatma of the Qur'an in 40 days, then he is considered as somebody who has abandoned the Qur'an. This book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was revealed for all of us to read and to benefit from and take heed from. The Salaf rahimahumallah ta'ala when the month of Ramadan came, do you know how much times they would finish the Qur'an? It is said that Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala finished the Qur'an in the month of Ramadan more than 60 times, twice a day. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala would finish the Qur'an every three days. And it's narrated from some of the Salaf rahimahullah ta'ala that they would finish reading the Qur'an every single night. That's how close they were to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a person might think, how, how? I spent three months or even more finishing one khatma, one Qur'an. How did they used to finish two a day? One every th uh, th uh, three a day, or uh, one, uh, one every day for three days, and so on. How do they so? How do they read so much Quran? That's because their relationship with with the Quran is the relationship with you and your devices, or us and our devices, our phones, our iPads, our dunyawi life. Those things that our heart is attached to, and we always constantly looking at. They were like that with the Quran. They read it so much times, they memorized it so much times that it became like speaking. Like me, for example, I'm speaking to you. I can get in three, four, five sentences, probably a paragraph within 10 seconds. Because I'm from Birmingham, but we speak very fast. We speak so fast and we don't think about what we're saying. And you can get many, many words in in a, in a short amount of time. That's how they were like with the Quran. 
When their mouths opened, when they were reading the Quran, it was as if they were talking. They'd have to think about what they're reciting. No mistakes, no stuttering, no stopping. Just complete flowing from their mouth. Because that's how close they were with the Quran. What about us? How long does it take us to read a page? We read a page and then our eyes start to close, we get tired. Or we read one page or two pages and we think, MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, I've done enough. Or we read a juz and we think, Alhamdulillah, I've done a juz. Where is that from finishing the Quran in the day and the night? Twice in a day. 60 times Imam Shafi, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he finished the Quran in a month. So evaluate your relationship with the Quran. Make this Ramadan that change. That after the salawat, after the prayers, you will take out at least 10 to 15 minutes in reading the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just reading it for reward, but reading it in the language that you understand. Many a times we read the Quran and we put it back. Alhamdulillah, we have the rewards, that's good. But have you never thought to yourself, what do these words actually mean? What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want from me? Why did Allah Azza wa reveal this Quran in a period of 23 years to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Was it only there for you to read and attain reward from? Or more than that, for you to understand and ponder and reflect and think and learn? Jibreel alayhi salatu salam, he would come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam every year in the month of Ramadan. وَكَانَ يُدَارِسُ مَعَهُ Quran. They would read the Quran one to another. And that's what the Salaf rahimahullah ta'ala did as well. They would read and they would ponder and they would reflect. And most importantly, they would act upon the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Acting upon what you have learned and what you have read. And this is what makes this ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam different to the previous nations. The previous nations, they would do a lot of actions, but based on no knowledge. And other than them, they would have a lot of knowledge, but they did no action at all. And both were condemned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being maghdubi alayhim and dalim. But this Ummah Muhammad alayhi salatu salam combines the two. We have knowledge, but we act upon that knowledge as well. Especially the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make it your goal that you at least will finish the Quran once in the month of Ramadan. And it's not a lot as well. One juz a day. If you want to do it after Fajr straight away, one juz, then Alhamdulillah. If not, then break it amongst the five daily prayers. At least read two to three pages before and after each salah. And if you are consistent in that, by the end of the month of Ramadan, you would have completed the Quran. But this month, as the Qari Hafizullah read, Allah Azza wa Jalla said, Shahru Ramadan, Alladhi unzila fihi al Quran. This is the month that the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was revealed. The actual words of Allah, verbatim, His words, the ones that He spoke, subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were revealed in this blessed month of Ramadan. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatin mubaraka. We reveal this Quran on a blessed night. And that is the night of Al Qadr, the night of decree. So because this book was revealed and Allah chose it to reveal it in this month, the month of Ramadan is also known as the month of the Quran. It's time for you to take that dusty mushaf off your shelf and start reading it. But most importantly, read it in the language you understand, whether it be in English or Urdu, or whichever other language. And if Allah has blessed you with the Arabic language, then Alhamdulillah, Nurun ala nur. But develop a relationship with this book. Don't waste time. Don't think that this book has no answers. It's just a book that was revealed 1,400 years ago. No, this book has the answer to every single problem that you are going through right now. Every difficulty in life, every stress, every problem, that direction and that guidance that you're looking for is found within this book. It is found within the Quran. Whether you believe me or not, try it, read it, reflect and ponder over it. And you will see yourself that the more you read this book, the more closer you are to this book, the more you understand this book and your love increases for it, then all of your life's problems will come at ease and they'll be solved. I'm not saying that just to make you feel better. I'm saying try it, do it. Invest your time and don't waste it. When it comes to the book of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, with every harf that you read from the Quran, as the Messenger of Allah told us, and all of us know this hadith, 
That with every, every letter that you recite, there is reward. There is ten rewards or tenfold of rewards. And Alif Lam Meem is not just one word, but rather Alif is a word. Lam is a word and Meem is a word as well. Thirty times the reward for just saying Alif Lam Meem. Imagine Al-Fatiha, imagine Al-Baqarah, imagine reading the whole of the Qur'an. How much rewards? But it goes back to what I said. You must have Iman and belief that you're going to attain these rewards. And you will, either in this dunya or even better in the akhirah, in the hereafter. Along with this month of Ramadan, with fasting and reading the book of Allah Azza wa Jal, we have the Qiyamul Layl, the standing in the night in prayer, what's known as a Taraweeh. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he also said, Man qama Ramadan, imanan wa ihtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambihi. The one who stands in the night of Ramadan, with Iman, with that same Iman and that hope and reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then his previous sins are forgiven and we have the best example in the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةً حَسَنًا In the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you have the best example Aisha radiallahu anha she said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would not pray more than 11 raka'at, neither in Ramadan nor outside of Ramadan. And he would extend that prayer. And he would dedicate worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To the point where his feet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was swollen. If you ever had swollen feet, then you know and understand what pain you'd go through. When your feet are swollen, they're, 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 they're fat, they hurt, they ache. It's hard for you to stand. But the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he still stood in front of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He didn't sit down, he stood. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, Oh Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, your feet are swollen. Look how swollen they are. So then the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Salam, he responded and he said, Afala akunu abdun shukura. Should I not be a thankful slave to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? This is the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the one whose sins are forgiven. Everything is forgiven for him. That's so why Aisha radiallahu anha, she, she said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, Allah has forgiven all of your sins, everything. You have nothing to worry about. And you're still standing like this. And he said, should I not be a thankful servant? Afala akunu abdan shukura. Subhanallah. This was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And where are we in comparison? Of course, we're never going to get to that level. But what is your night prayer like? How much times do you wake up in the, in the night to worship Allah Azza wa Jal? When it comes to taraweeh, are you there every single night? Or do you pray one or two or three or four raka'at and then you go to the back and you sit down and you stretch your legs and you go on your phone for a bit. And when the Imam goes into ruku'ah, you go into ruku'ah with him. This is laziness. It's not how the Muslim should see the month of Ramadan or especially the Qiyam al-Layl in the month of Ramadan. And the ulama, they say that the one who misses the Fatiha in the Salah on purpose. He hears the Salah. The Imam is reading the Salah. He's, he's leading the Salah. He's reading Al-Fatiha. And he misses it just to get to the Ruku'ah. This one has no Salah at all. So the affair is very dangerous. It's something to be wary of. That when it comes to our Ibadah, don't be lazy. Because if it was something else, like playing football with your friends, or going out, hiking, you're going adventuring, you're doing something, you're doing some activity, you're not tired then, you don't want to sit down then, you want your full attention, you want to be involved, you want to do everything. That's because you enjoy it, you like it. But what about standing in front of Allah Azza wa Jal? Where's the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How are you making the most of Ramadan if you're sit sitting at the back of the masjid, messing around with your friends, on your phones, distracted? <laughs> not caring about what's going on around you. So make this Ramadan the Ramadan of ibadah and worship. Stand with the Imam until the Imam he finishes. And then you can go home. The night prayer was obligatory upon the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam. It's not obligatory upon us. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed the taraweeh in Ramadan for three nights. As it comes in the hadith of Bukhari. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he stood on the first night 
and the people they st stood behind him and he led them in prayer the second night and the third and when it came to the fourth he sallallahu alayhi wasallam stopped because the congregation it grew and grew and grew look at the sahaba radiallahu anhum look at their mindset they saw the prophet alayhi salatu wasallam pray the taraweeh in ramadan and they joined him and each day as it went by it became fuller and fuller and fuller look at the hirs look at the emphasis look at the desire to attain these rewards where is our desire the sahaba they joined the prophet alayhi salatu wasallam even though the prophet sallallahu alayhi didn't tell them to he didn't say to them by the way it's taraweeh come pray behind me no but they did it from their own initiative because that their iman and their taqwa that's what it drove them to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in like manner they ran to the salah to the night prayer and they joined the messenger of Allah <coughs> what do we do we walked out the direction the opposite way right to the back and sit down try to have the himma try to have the enthusiasm of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu when it comes to worship. And on the fourth night, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he never came out to the masjid. And he prayed his taraweeh at home. <coughs> so then they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what happened? Sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you, 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 for the three nights, you were leading us in taraweeh. And all of a sudden, you didn't come on the fourth, what happened? The Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam, he said, and he gave him the reason. He said, I feared that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would make it obligatory upon you. He goes, I feared that Allah would make it obligatory upon you. Just like the Fajr, the Dhuhr, the Asr, the Maghrib, the Isha is obligatory upon us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was afraid that the Taraweeh would be likewise yani, obligatory upon us as well. <laughs> and he knew that his Ummah could not do it. The Ummah cannot do it, it's too hard for them. So he sallallahu alayhi wa refrained until he passed away. And that fear of it being obligatory was no longer there. And then Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda, he gathered them behind Ubay ibn Ka'ab. As the riwayah Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala mentions, that he joined them or that he, in, he informed them to stand behind Ubay ibn Ka'ab ala ihda wa ashrata raka'atan. 11 raka'at of taraweeh. That's what it says in the Wata Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala. And from then on, this tradition of taraweeh has been continuing amongst the Muslimin behind one Imam in the, in, in the Masjid. And that creates that sense of community, that sense of bond and brotherhood between the believers. So make the most of that. Don't waste it. Don't sit at the back. Don't go outside. And many children, youngsters, they, they, they do this. And how do I know? Because I was a youngster myself at one point as well. I'm going for taraweeh, mom and dad. Okay, go to the Masjid, pray Isha, and then... <coughs> We go outside playing knock or run. Or we go to the park. Or we go to eat somewhere. Or messing around. Using taraweeh as an excuse. And that's bad. That's a bad thing. It's not a good thing. Using taraweeh as an excuse to go and mess around with your friends. Or invest it in something else. It's in fact very shameful. It's very bad. It's not the mindset of a Muslim. You shouldn't play around with your religion like that. And parents also. You should encourage your children to come with you for salah. And you should not let them go on their own. All the youngsters are giving me daggers now. <laughs> you should not let them go on their own. Accompany them. Go with them. And make sure that they are praying the Salat. The Salat al taraweeh And they are not outside causing havoc and riffraff. The Qiyam al-Layl is one opportunity that you should take full advantage of. And not let go to waste. Another aspect of the month of Ramadan. One that you should make the most of. Is... A sadaqah, sadaqah, charity, giving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was narrated from him. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the most generous in the month of Ramadan. More so than outside the month of Ramadan. And if you know about the generosity of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam outside the month of Ramadan, then imagine within it. A man came to the Prophet alayhi salatu salam in his masjid. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had a rida on, he had a cloak on. One from Yemen, something very, very precious, very expensive. And this Bedouin man, he yanked it off the Messenger of Allah alayhi so he pulled it off to the point where the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, his neck was also pulled along with it and left us a mark, a red mark. And he said, give me, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa from the virtue of Allah. 
So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam looked at him. What did he do? Did he give him a backhand? No. He smiled and he took it off and he gave it to him. From the most precious thiyab, clothes of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Imagine that was you. You're wearing a, a, a designer scarf, for example, or you had a designer coat on or a jacket, and somebody comes and he starts yanking and says, "Here, yeah, give me." So what are you going to do? But because the Prophet والسلام, was so generous, he gave it to the man. And he would give everything that he had to the believers. And more so in the month of Ramadan. Because the Prophet وسلم, he set this example for us. He knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give him more from his bounty and his virtue. So give in the month of Ramadan as much as you can from your wealth. And as the Prophet والسلام, he said, Never does giving sadaqah diminish wealth. It is only shaitan who scares you with poverty. And when we say give sadaqah, we don't mean give 100 pounds, 200 pounds, 300 pounds, and the whole month you're poor, and you, don't, you can't pay your bills. No. Give something even though it is small, but for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. It goes a long way. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to Aisha radiallahu anha, that give sadaqah, O Aisha, even if it is with half of a date, you know the date that you eat when you open your fast? Half of that, if you was to give in sadaqah to somebody, sincerely, then it can set you free from the punishment of the hellfire. Something so great, yani, as the hellfire, in terms of its punishment and so yani, uh, harmful and, 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 and evil, giving half a day, just a fruit, a half a day fruit in sadaqah, it will protect you and save you from this punishment. And if you cannot give anything from your wealth, then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, even smiling in the face of your brother is sadaqah. Helping another Muslim is sadaqah. Helping in the masjid is sadaqah. Cleaning the house of Allah Azza wa Jal is sadaqah. Help distributing the food is sadaqah. And the Salaf rahimahumullah ta'ala, they would feed the people as well. As a form of sadaqah, feeding the ones who are fasting. The Prophet ﷺ told us that the one who feeds a fasting person, he attains the reward of that person as well, i.e. the same reward that he gets when he is fasting. So if you have the ability to feed somebody or give them some food, some water to drink, then do so. Increase in your generosity. Make the most of this month of Ramadan by attaining rewards by feeding somebody or giving them water or the like. So these are many things that we can do in this month of Ramadan to make the most of it, to maximize our benefit, to maximize our reward. And then when you do these things, when you fast with God consciousness, feeling Allah Azza wa Jal, when you read the book of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala and actually understand it, when you stand in the night prayer and worship Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala sincerely, when you feed the people, when you give sadaqah for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, then you will feel like, and you will say to yourself, you know what, I did good this Ramadan. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place in your heart that contentment and that happiness that, you know, I tried, even though still there's going to be nuqsan and deficiency because we're human at the end of the day. But the fact that you tried, the fact that you did something and you made some small change, then that is enough for you bi ta'ala. You have done the objective that was sought or to be sought from you in this month of Ramadan to increase in that khayr, to move from here to there even if you move a little and never belittle small deeds and small changes because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he accepts everything and in regards to sadaqah the hadith mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he accepts it with his right hand jalla wa ala wa tarbu fi kafir rahman and that this sadaqah, it magnifies and it increases in the palm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning Allah Azza wa He multiplies the reward for you, even if you give a little. And this is something which is tried and tested, by the way. The one who gives sadaqah lillah for the sake of Allah, he will receive even more afterwards. And try it. Don't wait till Ramadan to try it. Try it today. Give sadaqah and you will see how wealth comes back to you. How khair comes back to you from Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is something that I've experienced. And from my experiences, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to 
preserve our good deeds and not let them go to waste. I mean, but one brother he needed money, so I gave him some money, and it wasn't a lot of money. It wasn't a lot, but it was something that would help him. And then I said to him, "Pay me back whenever you want. Don't worry about it." So a few weeks go by, and the brother says that I'm not able to pay you back at the moment because of X, Y, and Z reason. And paying you back is going to be a bit difficult for me. So I said to him, don't worry. Keep the money and don't pay me back. My intention was to give it sadaqah lillahi azza wa jal. I said, don't pay me back, keep it. It's fine, no problem whatsoever. Within two weeks, a brother, he met me and he came to me, he gave me salams and I haven't seen him for probably two years. And he gives me an envelope and he goes, here, this is for you. I said, well, what's this? He goes, it's yours. I open the, the envelope and it's full of money. Probably 20 times more than what I gave that brother in the previous week. I said, why are you giving me this money for? Well, what did I do? He said, because you borrowed me this money two years ago. And you said, pay you back whenever you want. You never asked for it. But here, I, I have the ability now to pay you back. Two years ago. Two years ago, he owed me. And I forgot about it as well. I didn't recognize or, or know that he, I, he owed me this money. And he puts a wad of cash in my hand. And subhanallah, it comes from where you least expect it. I never asked him. I haven't seen him for two days, uh, two, days two years. I haven't seen him for a long time. He wasn't even on my mind. But because inshallah, you give sadaqah for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, that wealth, it comes back to you even more so. So do it for the sake of Allah and try it today. Don't go back and say, you know, the Imam, he said, you know, the speaker said that if I give money, I'm going to get money back. You know, if you're doing it for money, no, don't do it for money. Do it sincerely for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, that you really want to help somebody out. And then you will see how Allah Azza wa Jal, he replaces that with something far better and greater. So give sadaqah lillahi Azza wa Jal, whether it's to the masjid, whether it's to the orphans, whether it is to the poor. And those who are in most dire need of our sadaqat are our brothers and sisters in Palestine. And we know what is going on with them. And what better way and opportunity to use this Ramadan in regards to sadaqah than giving it to them. So give it to those trustworthy charities, those who are on the ground, those who are there making a difference. And give it fi sabilillahi azza wa jal. So my brothers and sisters, in conclusion, because time is running out, from what we have mentioned, there's much more to mention as well. Many affairs like i'tikaf, secluding yourself in the masjid for the last 10 days, worshipping Allah, trying to make umrah in Ramadan as well. The Prophet said that the one who makes umrah in the month of Ramadan is like equivalent to hajj. And in a narration, is like making hajj with me. There are many, many, many opportunities for ample reward. There are many opportunities to gain khair. There are many opportunities to increase in our iman and our taqwa and our reward and our good deeds and our closeness and relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it all starts with you. Only you can make that decision. I can't make it for you. The Imam of the Masjid can't make it for you. Your parents can't make it for you. Your friends can't make it for you. The only one who can is you. You are either your own success after Allah Azza wa Jal or you are your own downfall. You are your own success after Allah or you are your own downfall. And it's simple as that. It starts with you. And tawfiq is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wahdahu la sharika la. So if you really want to attain the pleasure of Allah, the forgiveness of Allah, the mercy of Allah, you really want to make the most of this Ramadan, then sincerely ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it happen. And want it in your heart as well. Not just because I'm saying these words, but because you and me and everybody in this room and in the dunya, all of us are in need of replenishing our worship, our status with Allah, our relationship with Allah, our closeness to Allah, our iman in Allah and our taqwa. Every single one of us needs that replenishment, that enlightenment. We all need the month of Ramadan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need any one of us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah azza wa jal allow us to benefit from the month of Ramadan. 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may He allow us to see the month of Ramadan. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept all of our good deeds. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to stay away from our sins. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Just for two minutes. Are you okay for some questions? Does anyone have any questions, please, on the topic of what the Ustad on what your stud has <coughs> spoken about today? Feel free, we've got a few minutes, the tea is on its way, inshallah. Yes, brother, go ahead. How do I uh, check slash control intent? Because sometimes I push do things which are the best, but with wrong intent. How do I control that intent? How do I Check, make that intent more pure. Mm. Okay. The brother has asked a sincere question. Uh, okay. How can one control their desires or their natural fitra while in the state of fasting? No. <clears throat> then this question, there really is no definite answer. This is one that Muslims themselves have been struggling with since the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave his da'wah to al-Islam. The Salaf rahimahullah ta'ala, they said that the hardest thing for us to maintain is our niyyah. Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, the hardest thing that I can control or that it's hard to control is my niyyah. Why? Because it changes. When you start off wanting to do it for Allah, then halfway it becomes for other than Allah. And then towards the end it becomes for Allah again. Sometimes it's not for Allah. And then throughout that deed, it's for Allah. It's something which is very hard to control. And something that only you know how to deal with. Because it's your heart at the end of the day. But what can help you rectify your niyyah is making sincere dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. Oh Allah, make my actions, and especially my intentions, for your sake alone. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئِ مَا نَوَى That our actions are by our intentions and every person will get what he or she intended. So it's, the affair returns back to you. How are you seeing this action? This action or this deed, are you doing it for Allah? Is it to impress others? Is it to gain their praise? And then when you can evaluate in, in this situation, you see that this is for Allah, then embark upon it. But if you think it's for other than Allah Azza wa Jal, then walk away from it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And sincerely make dua to Allah Azza wa that Allah gives you a good intention. This is a battle that every single one of us constantly we have to make on a daily basis. And until you can control your nafs, because the nafs can be controlled, and it's controlled by way of obeying Allah Azza wa making dua to Allah, asking Him for sincerity. Because tawfiq comes from Allah Azza wa and Allah alone. Not any one of us here can Grant ourselves tawfiq. It only comes from Allah Azza wa Jal. So ask from Him, bithnillah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, brother. Go ahead, Yaqub. Um, Jazakallah khair, thank you very much for yeah. the talk. If it come, when it comes to reading the Quran, uh, I struggle a bit obviously with, with Arabic. Mm. Uh, alhamdulillah means I get two rewards. Yeah. Uh, would it be better to try read the whole Quran in the English translation or uh, focus on what you read within the Arabic translation? I would say inshallah both. Because as you said, you're rewarded twice more when you read in Arabic, even though you, you find it hard. So of course, read it in Arabic because you're going to get more reward there than English. So I would say to you in both. Both, bismillah. Carry on reading it as much as you can in the Arabic and you'll gain the reward there and also in the English language for you to understand and benefit from even more so. So never leave off reading it in the Arabic language. Unless a person is complete, he's a complete novice, meaning he, he doesn't know Arabic at all, the new Muslim, or he just finds it very hard. Okay, for this person there is leeway. He doesn't have to read in the, the Arabic because he can't, he physically can't. La Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not bear, bear, bear the soul more than it can burden. So in your instance that you can read some even though you struggle, Continue to read insha'Allah, even though you might not finish the whole Quran, and if you do, that's amazing. But even if you can't, then continue and carry on insha'Allah. And by more practice, you get better. 
the more you practice, the better you get at it. So it wouldn't make sense for you to leave it off because then your practice would die down as well. So continue, inshallah, in reading in both languages. I mean, Allah grant you tawfiq. I mean. Exactly. Inshallah, we're going to have a short break now.